Until two days ago, that sound had never been heard on this earth. Suddenly, it has become as much a part of 20th century life as the whir of your vacuum cleaner. It's a report from man's farthest frontier, the radio signal transmitted by the Soviet Sputnik, the first man-made satellite as it passed over New York earlier today. General Motors Research Laboratory's involvement in the electric car advances can be traced to their original roots in the mid-1950s. In 1955, Congress passed the Air Pollution Control Act in 1955 and allowed for $5 million of funding for research and development into technologies that would improve air quality. General Motors joined the effort to explore advances that would ultimately have consumer application. This research started slowly, and the first examples to be achieved were strikingly similar to modern-day golf carts. They utilized multiple-stage individual car batteries, and the weight of this power source was insurmountable. In mid-1960, Dr. Howard Wilcox, affectionately known as Howie to his friends, was asked to head a new division within General Motors. At the time, he was the Secretary of Defense for Research and Engineering, and the new job was considered to be a higher level career. This new division would be referred to as the General Motors Defense Systems Division, and would be located on the grounds of the General Motors Technical Center. It would carry this name until 1961, when the division was relocated to Santa Barbara, California, and was rebranded as the General Motors Defense Laboratories. This division was to be sectioned into three individual categories, land, air, and sea into our planning under the inspiring leadership of men like General J.B. Medeiros went the experience of Dr. Werner von Braun and others of the German scientists who had perfected the original V-bomb. And into the separate teams that worked on the programs went the skills and talents of our own best minds. Scientists embracing a limitless roster of fields contributed to the staggering complex of component parts that went into each of our missile family. Howard was hired to create these divisions and stock them with the brightest minds he could achieve. For the purpose of this documentary, I have chosen to focus on the land division. Howard's first stop was the Avion, a defense department contractor. They had a young rising star that had been credited for his work on the Sidewinder missile and the periscope on the Nautilus. This young man's name was Donald Friedman. He was given sole credit for the heat-seeking components and design of the Sidewinder missile that was a favorite with the U.S. military. Here, pictures just released show a Sabre jet equipped with a new rocket device that can fire 24 rockets at a target located by electronics. The aircraft is guided by radar from the ground, and the jet's own radar locates and locks the position of the enemy. Designed for air-to-air -air combat, the plan is first tried out on ground targets. Here's the result. He was a practical genius, had classified military clearance, and was highly admired and thought of amongst his peers. Howard offered Don the position of department head for the entire land division. He was young, but highly qualified, and eager to make his mark on the world. Don was not yet a born-again idealist, and he accepted with enthusiasm. This would prove to be a brutal blow for Avion. Don was so well liked and admired that a vast majority of his colleagues would ultimately leave with him. In one fateful swoop, half of that company's IQ walked out the door to a new career within Don's new division at General Motors. They would ultimately be employed in interim in Detroit, but fate would relocate all of them to Santa Barbara in 1961. One of those bright young geniuses that followed Don out the door that one day was my friend, John Worth. He was hired by Don to be a research section head within the land division. John refers to these scientists that followed Don out the door that fateful day at Avion as charter members of the General Motors Defense Laboratories. Prior to the relocation to Santa Barbara and very close to his maiden project, John was asked by Don to design an electrical system that could propel a vehicle. The original mission program was uh, consisted of Don Friedman calling me into his office and asking me to come up with an electric car that uh, had the same performance and uh, the maximum possible efficiency, the same performance as a conventional automobile. No, uh, no specification, nothing. He just wanted it to be capable of jackrabbit starts, uh, 60 zero to 60 miles an hour in 30 seconds, 
and uh, much greater efficiency than, than old-fashioned uh, electric cars from the 1900s and the 1910s. That was it. He told me to go to work and come up with something. Don had recognized John's ability to think creatively at Avion, and he also held military clearance. The structure of the employment and the chain of command at the General Motors Defense Laboratories was so complex, secrecy was easy to achieve. In the early days of the electric drive research, Donald Freeman, Howard Wilcox, and Dr. Hofstad were the only people to recognize the application of this technology in a lunar vehicle. Mr. John Worth started this design creation in the fall of 1960 and finished in October of 1961. Although he collaborated on this project with Donald Freeman and Robert Colton, he was given virtually sole credit for the entirety of the early concept. With the concept being finalized, Don hired a new up-and-coming genius. Dr. Paul D. Agarwal was brought on to head the electric drive division in October 1961. From this date to the summer of 1963, Paul was given credit for concept analysis, concept selection, and project guidance. That's a formal way of saying that Paul was extraordinary at taking an idea and turning it into a functional prototype. This is witnessed in an internal defense lab memo that was created by Howard Wilcox on July 15, 1963. This concept would be submitted to the United States Patent Office three days later on July 18, 1963. This same patent would be renamed later as the High Performance Electric Drive System. There would be a total of five men that would be given credit for conceptual contributions, and the remaining two were Dr. Paul Agarwal and Richard Johnston. Richard would become evident in our story later on and was given sole credit for the design of the hybrid switches that were necessary in electric drive systems. 